You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way to go. It's a long way to Tipperary. To the sweetest girl I know. Hello, everyone, and welcome to History of the Great War, Episode 65. This week, I would like to thank Oscar and Vanessa, who also happens to be my aunt, both of whom have become subscribers to the podcast Patreon campaign. Subscribers get access to Patreon-only episodes and that good warm fuzzy feeling for helping make this podcast possible. So if that sounds like something that you would be into, head over to patreon.com slash historyofthegreatwar, or you can find the link over at historyofthegreatwar.com. Last episode, we discussed the process that led to the detailed planning for Verdun passing from the German 5th Army to Falkenhayn, where they were approved. This week, we move one step closer to the start of the battle in February, by looking at the German preparations for their attack. First, we will talk about one of the most important features of the fighting, which was the masses of German artillery that would be utilized in the opening barrage. Then we will take our discussion of plans down another level of detail to look at how the core of the 5th Army were arranged around Verdun and what orders they were given and also what orders they gave to the infantry that would be executing the attack. Then we will dive into some specific preparations happening on the ground that were unique to the attack at Verdun. The German troops then had to suffer through weeks of waiting for the weather to be right for the attack, which was a painful and slow process given the winter weather that blew through the region in early February 1916. We will close out the episode by going on a pretty lengthy sidetrack that comes to you courtesy of the book Ring of Steel by Alexander Watson on the German and Austrian armies in 1916 that I think is super interesting and might be an important piece of information when you are evaluating the actions in 1916 as a whole. So I have decided to throw it at the end of this episode, since it sort of fits, and we're going to be really busy in the upcoming episodes, and sort of I just really want to talk about it. In his book, Verdun, The Longest Battle, Paul Jankowski gives this probably apocryphal account of an exchange between some German artillery officers and an infantry captain. Quote, gentlemen, there will be no offensive for you, only a promenade. End quote. This is truly what many German leaders believed, that with the artillery as the centerpiece of all of the preparations, the guns would blast a hole through the French lines that the infantry would simply have to occupy. It was only in this way that the Germans could keep their casualties down, while also inflicting as much pain as possible on the French opposite of them. The hope was that the French reinforcements, who would certainly arrive in great force once the offensive got going, would also be chewed up in the same way as the troops that were there to begin with. To accomplish these lofty goals, the artillery, all of it, was put under the command of the staff of the 5th Army, instead of being under the command of individual corps and battalions. The staff of the 5th Army then split the guns into groups that were each given a specific task. These tasks and guns were given to artillery commanders who were then able to decide how best to get the job done. Every type of gun had a specific purpose during the opening bombardment, and then during and after the infantry attacks. For example, the lighter guns, after providing their last barrages to the enemy, would move up as soon as possible after the infantry went forward. The heavy guns to the rear would up their fire rate to make up for the lack of light fire. Once the light guns were established in new positions closer to the front, the heavy guns would then move up, with the light guns taking up the slack. Or at least that was the theory. Moving the guns up was no small task, especially the larger howitzers. Because of the effort required, all possible preparations were done beforehand, specifically around preparing secondary positions for the artillery. These positions were prepared by first selecting them, then clearing and leveling the ground, and pouring concrete if necessary or even possible, and then bringing up enough ammunition to keep the gun firing while the supply train caught up. Most importantly, these areas were camouflaged as well. If natural cover was not present, then camouflage netting was put in place to hide the guns from French observers. The infantry also had orders to find and secure possible artillery positions as they advanced. 
to accomplish both this task and, more importantly, to keep the link between the advancing infantry and the guns intact. There would be artillery observers sent forward with the infantry, with telephone cables, which were probably cut pretty quickly, but also signal flares and signal balloons. These last two forms of communication could either call in or halt the fire of artillery from behind. One extremely important piece of the preparation had nothing to do with the infantry, or the artillery planning, or the ammunition, but instead was the construction of large repair depots behind the lines for the artillery. There would end up being five of these large depots behind the front to take care of the guns. Damage to the guns came in two forms, the first being damage suffered from enemy fire, which could hopefully be kept to a minimum. There was also the standard wear and tear experienced after firing hundreds and hundreds of rounds. Remember, these guns have an explosion going off inside of them, time and time again, which caused wear on the barrel, which would have devastating results. Generally, an artillery shell, or a rifle bullet in a gun to scale it down a little bit, fits pretty snug in the barrel on its way out. This prevents the explosive gas from escaping during the firing process, which is important to give the shell its maximum and more critically predictable range. As the barrel wears out and the shell starts fitting looser and looser, more and more of the gas escapes, and the shells start oscillating much more during flight. I'm an American, so I get to make an American sports reference here. It's sort of like an American football when the quarterback throws a spiral or he throws like a lame duck pass that floats around a lot in the air. Those ones that aren't spirals, that aren't sort of shooting through the air, just aren't as accurate. And that's exactly what would happen here. This would even get to the point where they might start tumbling through the air, which could be disastrous. This might mean that the shell would go to the left or to the right of the target or catastrophically fall short and onto friendly troops. Judging by the first-hand accounts that I have read, nothing seems to be worse for morale than having your own fire fall onto you. This was a problem that the Germans would keep under control early in the campaign, but as the year wore on and resources began to be allocated to other fronts, it would become a much, much larger problem and a much, much greater concern for the German infantry. The plan for the German barrage was to cover a wide area before the attack. This, of course, included all of the front lines, but also as far back as the bridges over the River Meuse and some of the supply routes into Verdun. There was a special emphasis put into neutralizing the French artillery. And to accomplish this task, special batteries of 150mm howitzers were provided with gas shells that would be fired on the known French artillery positions right before the attack. It was hoped that a good dose of gas on the unprepared French artillerymen would silence their guns, at least momentarily. When they were not performing this mission, the 150 millimeters, with their long range and precision, would be targeting specific supply routes behind the front. To feed all of the artillery arranged around Verdun, it required a huge amount of work and a constant flow of ammunition to feed the guns. This meant that new rail lines had to be built and ammunition dumps created and built up. Ten new rail lines were built up to the front just to handle the movement of supplies, this being on top of the already very developed set of lines that had made the area attractive to Falkenhayn to begin with. For the duration of the opening weeks of the battle, 2.5 million shells were kept near the front in huge artillery dumps or at the gun positions themselves. This is a pretty big number, mind-numbingly big, really, 2.5 million, I, I can't really picture it, but this was only a six-day supply, so they had to do this every week. Before the attack even got started, over 200 trainloads of munitions had been brought onto the scene, and after the first shots were fired, 33 trains would arrive in the area every single day to keep the guns firing. Now that's 33 trains just for the artillery. That does not count the thousands and thousands of pounds of other materials that had to be brought in to keep the rest of the 5th Army fighting. Thousands of rations, rifle bullets, grenades, sandbags, everything to keep an army in the field had to be brought in by train. In the two months leading up to the battle, or at least when the battle was scheduled to start, over 1,000 trainloads of supplies were brought in. 
So those 2.5 million rounds of artillery ammunition on 200 train loads was just a fifth of the total supplies needed to get the action started. With all of this artillery ammunition in the area, a logical question would be what on earth, and how many of them, did the Germans have to fire at all? Well, they had a lot of artillery. Like, a lot, a lot. To start with, there were over 1,200 guns in total, but this does not tell the whole story. Some of these guns were truly massive. There were, of course, large numbers of smaller guns, the 110, the 150, the 210 millimeter howitzers that were stationed closer to the front and were made to be mobile. But there were also 11 30.5 centimeter and 14 42 centimeter guns, similar to the ones that had been used in Belgium at the start of the war. For those listeners accustomed to the imperial system of weights and measures, a foot is 30 centimeters, so all 25 of those guns fired a shell larger than a foot. There were also three of the newest of the massive guns in the German arsenal. These were the 38 centimeter guns that were fresh from the factory. One of these was called Big Max, and in his book Verdun, The Lost History, John Mosier describes how the gun was set up and prepared for battle. Quote, the gun itself was mounted on a circular concrete platform about 20 meters in diameter and 5 meters deep, enabling it to have a wide angle of fire horizontally. Big Max, as it was known, fired a 750 kilogram shell containing 183 kilograms of explosive over a range of 35 kilometers, and it was finally abandoned in October 1918. End quote. So some of these artillery positions were built to last. To get this many of the best guns in the German army in one place, all the other armies on the front had to be robbed from, often having their newest and best guns replaced by older, less efficient models, or even captured enemy artillery. So when the time came for the firing to start, these guns would be the ones using all of the ammunition. But of course, even with all of this fire, the artillery could not capture any territory by themselves. That was up to the infantry. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons. Any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com slash GW50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. For this purpose, there were four corps that would take part in the initial fighting. The 3rd, the 7th, the 15th, and the 17th. In January, the staff of the 5th Army started detailed planning for the attack, and the first thing that they did was slice up the front into four pieces and assign one corps to each. Then goals were assigned out to each of the corps, which would then assign goals to each division, so on and so forth down the line. All along this chain of command, emphasis was placed on keeping German casualties low. However, in the orders from the 5th Army, there was also the stated goal of keeping up the pressure on the French to keep them from being able to reconsolidate their positions once the advance got rolling. To many of the commanders of the 5th Army, these two facts, keeping casualties low but keeping the attack going, seemed at odds. (laughs) 
what should be given priority. There would inevitably be instances where commanders were asked to choose between X number of casualties balanced against further attacks. Even after clarification was requested, the original orders stood as written, and each corps would act on them a little differently. This would create a situation where each corps would not behave the same on the day of the attack. Some of them would attack in a cautious way designed to minimize casualties, like Falkenhayn intended, while others would attack aggressively trying to capture ground quickly, which cost more men but it was in line with the army's orders. While it is almost inevitable that different commanders will act differently on the same set of orders, this is what makes some commanders great and some really crappy, in this case it would cause a big problem for some of the German units, especially once Falkenhayn started refusing to send more troops into the area. The units that had been exhausted, who had exhausted themselves in their attacks, often in the most critical areas, were not given reinforcements needed to continue on the attack immediately, when they were most likely to accomplish their goal, which would inevitably cause the attack to bog down against French resistance. So in this way, the difference of opinions between the Crown Prince and Falkenhayn about whether to attack to take the city or attack to cause casualties managed to filter down the chain of command to the core and divisions of the 5th Army. But the attack was still planned to begin on February the 12th. That is one thing that everybody agreed on. But then the winter got bad. Really bad. The waiting would be really tough on the German troops. During the preparation for the attack, the Germans had built a great number of stolen, or underground, galleries. These had been designed to give the attacking troops a place to stay that was protected from the French artillery in the days leading up to the attack. The stolen were very well protected, and some were large enough to hold half a battalion of men. When the time came for the attack, the men would move out of their stolen, up through the trenches, and then out to the attack. Originally, the attack was supposed to start on the 12th, and on the 11th, the crown prince even prepared his message for the troops for the next day. Quote, After a long period of stubborn stubborn defense, the orders of his majesty, our emperor and king, call us to the attack. End quote. But when the next day came, so too did heavy, heavy snow, cutting visibility drastically. For the German plan predicated on artillery, this meant that the attack had to be delayed. The Germans required good visibility for artillery spotters, observation balloons, and pilots above the battlefield, and it was felt that without these three things it would be impossible for the artillery to be effective. And so, the attack was delayed for 24 hours, and then it was delayed day after day for the next 10 days. During this massive delay, the German troops in their stolen experienced a kind of hell. These shelters had been designed, provisioned, and planned to only have troops in them for a few hours leading up to the attack. There were not even enough beds for all of the troops that were huddled inside. So instead of being able to stay in them for the duration of the delay, Many of the troops were forced to march back and forth between their stolen and their permanent billets every time that the attack was scheduled to kick off. They would reach their billets after a long march in the freezing weather, sleep for a few hours, and then maybe march back to the stolen, again through the cold, and then spend most of the day hanging around, or even worse, trying to get the water that was accumulating on the floor out of the stolen. While all of this marching back and forth through the cold took its physical toll on the troops, the effect it had on the mentality of the German soldiers was far worse. Getting into a mental state of being ready to attack was difficult enough, then having to do it over and over, over again, over the course of two weeks, was almost impossible. The constant waiting dulled the enthusiasm and lowered the morale of the troops. Unfortunately, The discomfort of the German troops was not the worst consequence of the delay. On a strategic level, the French spent the delay increasing their readiness for the attack almost every single day. We will talk more about the French preparations in the next episodes, but suffice to say that many historians believe that if the German attack had went forward on schedule, the history of the Battle of Verdun would be very different. The Germans had tried their best to keep the preparations for Verdun secret from the French. Part of this was done at Verdun, like making sure that the Germans always had control of the air over the battlefield. 
We will dig into the German Air Armada next week. However, this was not the only focus of the German plans to prevent the French from concentrating on Verdun. Much of this took place at an army level and above, designed to make the French high command believe that the main attack was happening elsewhere, anywhere else really. All along the front, from the coast to Switzerland, there were armies involved in confusing the French and British. The attack on Belfort continued to be planned, and the crown prince even toured the line near the planned attack area. When he did this tour, it was in perhaps the least secretive way possible. The preparations here at Belfort would continue right up until and after the attack at Verdun started. The 4th Army prepared to launch an attack near Ypres, and the 6th and 3rd Armies prepared to attack on their fronts. Some of these attacks were even launched on a small scale as diversions. The 5th Army did none of this, focused instead on doing its best job to keep local preparations as secretive as possible. The preparations were of course completed at night. Falkenhayn also went to great lengths at the general staff level to keep the operations secretive. He did not tell other German leaders like Bethmann Holweg of his intentions until close to the time of the attack, and the overall number of people involved in planning was kept to the absolute minimum. Very few of the planning discussions were even written down, Falkenhayn insisting on face-to-face -face conversations for much of the large decision-making. German strategy and the path to Verdun by Robert Foley has this to say about the consequences of this policy. This secrecy had two significant consequences. First, it made it difficult for Falkenhayn's subordinates to understand properly the general chief's strategic and operational ideas. Falkenhayn merely gave his staff specific situations from which they were required to submit operational plans. End quote. The lack of material about the planning process for Verdun also makes it extremely difficult to determine the exact evolution of the plan, and this all ties back of course to the existence or non-existence of the Christmas letter that we discussed last episode. Part of the reason historians are so dependent on that letter is because of the lack of other written material detailing the planning for the attack. Unfortunately, even with all of these attempts at deception, and the links that Falkenhayn went to before the attack, the French would know the attack was coming, especially after the delays drug on and on throughout February. One of the problems with creating the podcast that I will probably never be able to solve is that I, employed full-time as a software engineer for my real job, cannot read every great source about the war before I start writing episodes. I just don't have the time. I try to find good, complete sources on every topic that we discuss that covers a wide variety of thoughts on the topic, but sometimes I will find a great one only after I've done many episodes on a topic. Our source of the week is an example of one of these sources, and that's Ring of Steel by Alexander Watson. It is a great book looking at the war, but unlike most English sources, it focuses strictly on the events in Germany and Austria-Hungary, with large pieces of the book devoted to the changes in German and Austrian societies during the war. All of that will of course be useful later, I just wish I'd read it before releasing the episodes last year. This is all in the past. But for right now, I want to focus on a section from Ring of Steel that focuses on how the German and Austrian armies changed in the year and a half of the war leading up to 1916. The armies had changed since August 1914, prompting Alistair Horn in The Price of Glory to say, quote, The troops that faced each other at Verdun represented the peak the war was to produce. Like steel that has been tempered for just the right length of time, they were hard and tensile, but not yet brittle, no longer the green enthusiasts of 1914, not yet the battle-weary veterans of 1917-1918." The question becomes, was this statement by Horn accurate from a German perspective? The armies in 1916 were made up of more conscripts than they had been when the war started, simply due to attrition. But there was also a serious problem in the number of career officers which had become casualties, and this was the blight of all of the armies in the first year of the war. These men and their experience was essential to turning the raw recruits of the following years into competent soldiers, and there were far too few of them that returned from the killing fields of 1914. 
Because of this, the ability of all of the armies in 1916, on a unit-to-unit basis, had probably decreased, even if the armies as a whole were far better equipped and prepared for warfare. By the beginning of 1916, one in six of German active officers had been killed. That's not wounded, or captured, or missing. Confirmed killed. This was felt the hardest at the front line, where not only the casualties were felt, but also many officers had been pulled out to take up staff positions in the rear. This was done to try and get at least a skeleton crew of experienced officers for all of the new formations that were being created out of fresh conscripts after 1914. The attrition rate was also greatly affected on the German reserve officers that had their period of active duty in the years before the war. All of these factors came together to mean that in 1916, most German officers on the front lines were Kriegsofficer, or war officers. While these officers were obviously at an experience disadvantage compared to those that they were placed, they also had other issues. There had been a slow increase in hostility between officers and men in the ranks of the German army. Part of this was just the tension between the men at the front and the staff officers behind the line, but this was pretty typical on all fronts in all the armies. But there was also enough hate to go around for the junior officers at the front. They were under a lot of stress, and were not helped by the fact that the soldiers under their command were older than them and often had far more experience in the war. This was a problem for experienced units at the front, but also of reserve formations newly arriving from Germany. These formations were often made up of older men that were now putting under the command of much younger men, fresh from officer school. In other armies, like the French army for instance, when there were not enough experienced officers available to make good casualties, some positions were filled by commissioning non-commissioned officers to take their places. They found it far more effective to promote an experienced NCO and give them new responsibilities, instead of trying to train up a new officer. This was not something that was done by the German army during the opening years of the war. There were certain educational requirements that made it very difficult for an NCO to get promoted, and there was also a manpower shortage in the NCO ranks to deal with as well. With so many casualties in all ranks, from the top to the bottom, the men were just less effective. Here is a quote from Ring of Steel to explain why. Quote, The soldiers recruited in wartime were on average less effective than their predecessors for three reasons. First, they were often less fit. To meet urgent manpower needs, the German army had lowered its medical requirements drastically at the end of 1914, drafting even the partially disabled, mentally ill, and deaf. Predictably, these proved to be poor soldiers, and in the spring of 1915, medical entry standards were again raised, and a new gradation system, dividing men as fit for the front, garrison, or labor service was introduced. Second, the wartime replacements were often a little too young or a little too old than is optimal for soldiering. Finally, these new soldiers had passed through only brief military training. In peace, drafted men served two years. In war, recruits in the German army received eight weeks of basic instruction in home camps, plus another four in field recruit depots. End quote. Now that I've spent the last five minutes talking about how horrible the German army had it, and the doom and gloom that was going to cause the German army to collapse, let me reel it back in, and reel it back in real fast. The German army in 1916, even with the problems listed above, which, oh by the way, everybody else was experiencing, was more powerful in 1916 than at any point in the war up to that time. Their equipment and armament was far better. Their tactics had hugely improved. They were led by a large and fine set of officers who really knew their stuff. Discipline and belief in the cause was as strong as ever, Morale was high. On the Eastern Front, they had been victorious. On the Western Front, they had stood strong. But everybody who found themselves at Verdun would be tested mightily by what they would soon face. I hope you will join me next week as we finally get around to discussing a bit more about the French preparations for the attack.